what I want to do tonight is really run through, rather than focus in on one little part of the subject, give an overview of the whole subject and how it's developed over the years. This is some things are easily, easily forgotten when we're doing our day-to-day -day work. Engineers, engineers like love to design fancy structures with fancy calculations on fancy computers, and fancy codes of practice. But it's it's worth remembering that four sim there are four simple equations which are sufficient to tell you most of what you need to know to design most structures. First of these ones, I hope you all know. Equation for the bend, maximum bending moment in a beam supporting a uniform load. M is WL18. Next one, I hope you know as well. The equation for the maximum bending stress in a beam. And the third one is the equation for, for compressive or tensile stress in a member. Force over area equals stress. Those are the three out of the four equations. The fourth one is a bit is quite different because it concerns slender columns. And whereas all the other equations concern strength, that's either intention or compression, a slender column can fail by instability, buckling. And buckling is a very sudden can be a very sudden failure with almost no warning, and it's catastrophic. If a column buckles, it's gone, and it's got, it's got no strength left whatsoever, and your structure is probably a heap of rubble on the floor. The other difference with uh, buckling is, whereas bending and crushing are related to the strength of the material, buckling is related to the stiffness of the material. And to understand buckling, the first person we've got to go back to is this chap, Leonard Euler. Very clever bloke. Swiss mathematician. He was responsible for many fundamental advances in mathematics and physics. And in 1744, he worked out the equation of the buckling strength of an axial loaded slender column, pi squared c over l squared. That's the fourth of the basic equations I want to give you. If you take those four equations, and combine them with some basic material tests, you have most of what you need you have most of what you need to know for to design most structures. It's not everything, but you've got the basics, you've got the gist of it. Tonight I want to look into column design in more detail. And the first thing that oh sorry, there's there's one more thing to be said, is you combine the crushing crushing load on a, on, a, on a member with the buckling load, and you get a graph like that. So you can see that up to a point, the column fails by crushing, and beyond that, it fails by buckling. Going beyond the basics into more the finer points, first thing to be said is most columns are not perfectly straight. And analyzing an imperfect column is quite a lot more difficult than a straight one. When we want to analyze imperfect columns, this is your man, another very clever bloke, Thomas Young. He's quite, he's quite an extraordinary figure. He was a doctor by profession. He could speak 13 languages. He was the first person to translate the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone. He, proved, he, he proved, provided the proof that light is a form of wave, wave energy and worked out the of color. He worked out how the eye focuses and sees color. He did the first ever calculated estimate of the size of a molecule. And in 1803, in a lecture at the Royal Institution, it was published in 1807, he presented the concept of an elastic modulus, which we now know as Young's modulus. He's the Young of Young's modulus. He didn't just do, present that concept, however. He worked out most of the things you can do once you have an idea of the con once you've worked out the concept of an elastic modulus. So the equations for bending, stress, deflection, torsion, you worked them all out, and they were all presented in one lecture 
when you've got an elastic modulus, you can go back to Euler's equation. Instead of pi squared c over l squared, the c, which is the stiffness of the member, becomes ei, which is the form that we're familiar with that equation in. And in that lecture, Thomas Young also turned his attention to what happens in an imperfect slender column. And he worked out how you calculate the deflection of an imperfect slender column under load. And that's Young's equation from 1807. The key of that is, of course, if you can work out the deflection in the slender column under load, you can work out the stress in it. If you can work out the stress in it, you can work out its, its, its load capacity. In other words, Young solved the capacity of imperfect slender columns as they published in 1807. Now, so therefore, the essential elements of the theory of slender column design were all solved over two centuries ago. However, at the time, nobody paid very much attention because the columns that people were building were either of masonry or cast iron, usually. They weren't slender, and they had quite a lot of problems with variability of the quality of the materials. And so the, the engineers of the day re relied very heavily on a lot of testing and, and empirical design. Design using theoretical calculations didn't really come to the fore until the end of the 19th century. But mass-produced steel came in in the 1880s and 1890s. And once you have steel, you have a material that's got beautiful linear elastic properties and it's very consistent and it's very reliable. And so you can actually, it becomes very, and also you can design quite slender structures. So there's a renewed interest in slender, in slender columns. Many different people after Young solved, solved the problem again, although he had solved it back in 1807. And there are many they had their own individual variations. The one you probably may well be familiar with, for example, is the Perry Robertson equation used in steelwork design. The point I'd like to make is that the, the for steel at least, the theory of slender column design was basically settled by the early 20th century. And since then, there have only been minor adjustments to minor details. This graph gives you an idea of, it's quite interesting about what's happened. That shows you the permissible stresses for slender mild steel columns over the period 1909 to 1989. The lowest line is 1909, and the top line is BS449-1989. Now, if you take out of that the changes in the yield strength of the material and also the reductions in safety factor, the factors that have been applied over the years, you can see those curves are all very similar. Not a lot's changed between 1909 and 1989. When we come to the latest codes, that's essentially how things are. But there have been there are some some changes, and some of these are interesting. One you'll probably be familiar with is the permissible stresses for slender columns are now different for different cross different types of steel section. So the permissible stresses for universal column sections are lower than for say tubes or AI sections. The reason for that's quite interesting. It's to do with the way that steel is made. You all know that steel is, ba is basically made from a molten state and then rolled out and then it, it cools and solidifies. What happens in a tube, the steel will all cool at roughly the same rate. However, in a column section, the, the toes of the flanges will cool first, and they'll solidify first. And then the, the middle of the section tends to cool down and solidify later. So what happens is that when the middle of the section starts to solidify and cool, as it cools, it shrinks. So it tries to become shorter, 
but the toes of the flanges have already solidified. So they are put into compression. And so if you actually took a column section and were able to measure the stress of the steel as it just just lying on the floor, the, the, the stress in the steel, you would find that the toes of the flanges have quite a high compressive stress in them. And the, the center of the section is in tension. It's got a kind of pre-stress following from the different, the, the, where the, the fact that the different parts cool different, at different points. And that affects its buckling capacity. If you imagine you have a column buckling, it, it, deflects, and it deflects as it takes up load. And the maximum load happens when the toes of the flanges reach yield. Now, if the, if the column has no, had no stress in it to start with, everything would be as per theory. However, in a column section like this, if the toes of the flanges are already in compression, then they're going to reach a yield before theory says they, they should, and the column is going to fit, fail at a lower load. And that's why the allowable stress for column sections is, is lower than, it, than for sections like tubes. There have been other cha changes in column design rules. Some of them caused by, some of them are from code committees fiddling around with the design rules. And some, some, prob some problems that need addressing are, are what the engineers that use codes do. So first, in BS 5950, there's a rather embarrassing mistake the definition of the length of a column is wrong. You can't get much more basic than that. It says the length of a the length L of, of, a, col of, a, of a column is the length between the points at which it's restrained against buckling. Think of a cantilever column. It's only restrained at one end and not at the other. The distance between the points where it's restrained against buckling is infinity. And as I think anybody knows, if a column has a length of infinity, its strength is zero. So by that definition, cantilever columns would have a strength of zero. This other error is a bit more subtle. The 2000 edition of BS 5950 introduced this clause, which makes design a lot more complicated because it says you've got to put in a notional horizontal load into any structure, even when the wind's not blowing. And the clause says that the purpose of this is to allow for the effects of, of imperfections such as lack of verticality. That's all fair enough, except that when you've done your analysis and you go to design your columns, you go to the, stre the, the tables that give you the allowable stresses for slender columns, and these already have an allowance for imperfections. So this clause is just plain wrong. It's double, count, it's double counting the effects of imperfections. And it's really the worst kind of error. It's making, light, it's, it's making the design work more complicated, and it's also making the, the, design, the answer more wrong. You, you can't get much worse than that. Um, but we're, we're stuck with it because both of those errors, I pointed them out in a paper back in 2006, but nothing's been done about them. Other problems I'd like to point you to are really more in the hands of engin the engineers using the codes. I don't know how many of you ever use these charts for effective length at the end of BS 5950, Appendix E. If you, I think most engineers don't. But if you do think of using them, be very, very cautious. On the face of it, they're very useful. They look as though they'll be very useful. They tell you in quite a lot of detail how the effective length of a column varies depending on its stiffness and the stiffness of the incoming beams. However, I don't know if you can see clearly on your screen, at the bottom left of the left-hand chart, there is a situation where the column is fixed top and bottom, and it gives an effective length factor of 0 0.5 instead of the 0 0.7 that's normally recommended in the code. 0 0.5 is the theoretical effective length of a column with perfectly fixed 
rigid ends. You can only achieve that effective length factor if the incoming beams are infinitely rigid and the connections are also infinitely rigid. In real life, that just doesn't happen. Connections are nearly always bolted. They're bolted with plates and fit up, and they have flexibility. At the minute you put any flexibility whatsoever into the calculation, any connection flexibility, the effective length goes up. So these charts can actually be extremely dangerous because the figures, the results they give, it doesn't, there isn't a caution, a note recommending caution put on, on them, which is they're not applicable unless you've got 100% rigid connections. I would say generally don't use those charts. They look interesting, but steer well clear. Now, we've still got to work out how to get the effective length of a column. And I won't embarrass you by asking for a poll of how pe many people always put one in as their effective length factor. If you do, please stop and think a little. Let's go back to Euler's equation. Look at that and think about it. What that says is that the strength of a slender column is inversely proportional to the square of its length. What that means is if you underestimate the effective length by 10%, you're overestimating the strength of the column by over 20%. If you underestimate the effective length by 20%, you're overestimating its strength by more than 50%. Errors in effective length, the assumed effective lengths, have a huge effect Make a complete non sufficient to make a complete nonsense of any fancy calculations of stresses. So be be very care. You have to be very careful. Not just pull down the, the drop down box and always put one in it. You really need to think about it. Now, so people may say, "Oh well, can we calculate if accurate effective lengths?" Well, in theory, yes, you can. You could build a super duper computer model with all the stiffnesses of the members and the stiffnesses of the end plates of the beam connections, and the stiffnesses of the bolts, and everything, work it all out. But it's an enormously, enormous task. And you can, you're analyzing the completed structure. And if you find that the thing doesn't work, then you've got to change your whole structural design. It's one of these kind of exercises that is a, it's a very interesting for research projects, but really of no use whatsoever for real practical design. For practical design, there's really nothing more you can do than to refer to the table in the code, which gives recommendations and describes the end conditions for beams. And it's what with these tables, rather than just glancing it and moving on, it's what it, it's that particularly an unbraced structure. It really is it's not just a good idea, it's really important to, to sit and think a bit. Look at the structure, Look at think about what the column you're trying to design is doing. Consider carefully what's said in the table and make sure you've picked the right effective length factor. And if you're not sure, err a little bit on the high side, the effective length factor. A lot of people assume that with modern fancy computer programs, Engineers don't need to think anymore, but I would say when you come to an issue like this, in reality, engineers need to think more when they're using a fancy computer program. There's an old saying which sums up at least what I think on these matters, better to be roughly right than it is to be precisely wrong. So that's steel. What about concrete? Well, concrete columns are a different story altogether. Concrete, reinforced concrete columns and walls are very common, but for most of the 20th century, the design of them was based on very crude empirical rules. Here's what the reduction factors for reinforced concrete columns were in the Britain until 1957. You could flatteringly say, well, it's simple. I'll give it that, but it's, 
not exactly very sophisticated, and it's not a lot to do with careful, careful theoretical calculations. In 1957, it was improved a bit, and it became that. And that, those, that's, that was, those, were, those were design rules for reinforced concrete columns in Britain until the mid-1970s. So you have a situation where reinforced concrete columns are very common, but the design, method, the design methods in recent times are nothing like as accurate as the steel design rules were 100 years ago. Why is this? Well, there are two reasons. First is that, in fact, truly slender concrete columns are actually very rare. If you have a concrete column, very few concrete columns are of a height to thickness to width ratio greater than 12 or 15. So you don't really very often get into true slender column behavior. The other reason why the rules are how they are is that working out the true behavior of a slender reinforced concrete column is actually extremely difficult. For a start, instead of one material, like in steel, you've got two. Now, one of the materials in reinforced concrete column is steel, but the other is concrete, which has a non-linear stress-strain curve. It cracks, it shrinks, it creeps, and you've got to combine it, what it's doing, with what the steel is doing, and put the two together. And the com working out the com what's happening in the combination of these two materials it's an absolute nightmare to analyze. Worse still, the long-term capacity of a reinforced concrete column is different from its short-term load capacity. So if you're trying to solve the problem by empirical testing, most concrete columns, so most of the load they support is a long is, is a long-term load. So it's the long-term load capacity you really need to know. But an empirical test of long-term load capacity, by definition, takes a long time. So it costs a lot of money. And then it's even worse than that, because if you think about it, you need to know what the answer is going to be before you set up the test. If you're going to put the, the long-term load, that's going to, the, the load on it, that's going to cause failure in the long term. So it, there are good reasons why reinforced concrete column design has lagged behind. When I first got involved and took an interest in this area in the 1980s, I looked up various research papers and so on. And one I found was a, a report prepared in, in the late 1930s for the building research station by Dr. Thomas. And I contacted them and they still had copies in stock, so I got one. And it was very good indeed. It was very clear. Uh, he'd gone back to Young's equation. He'd <coughs> worked based on that. He'd worked out that the reduction in strength against slenderness shouldn't be a, a straight line relationship. It should be an S-shaped curve. And they'd done a lot, quite a lot of good work. And it said in the report that having basically solved the problem for short-term loads, they were going to go on and investigate long-term loads. But I made a lot of inquiries, and I couldn't find any find what happened about long-term load tests and research. So I took the liberty of looking up the institution's yearbook and found that Dr. Thomas was still alive at the time. And I wrote to him, and I got a very nice letter back. He said, when they'd done their first lot of research, they thought having solved short term, it wouldn't be difficult to go on and complete the job by solving long term loads. However, what they found was, he says, I don't know how many columns we ended up testing, but I ended up, they ended up giving up, beaten by the sheer but variability of concrete. And when it came to design rules, he agreed that it should be an S-shaped curve, and he sat on code committees and he said, the, pra the practicing engineers of the day refused point blank to accept anything other than a simple linear relationship. And that's where things got stuck. <laughs>
In the early 1970s, 1972 to be exact, a new concrete code came out, CP110, and it had new rules for reinforced concrete spinal columns based on 1960s European research. The rules are quite a lot more complicated than CP114, but this graph here shows you how the capacity of a column, theoretical capacity of a column, varies with slenderness. In If it's designed to CP110, a, compared with its predecessor, CP114. I think you can see he pays your money and takes your choice. Although it's quite a lot more complicated design method, it's not really necessarily much, any better in terms of accuracy. In particular, if you look at it, it, it implies that slenderness has no effect whatsoever on the capacity of the column until the slenderness is well past 20, after which it plummets. I don't think that's right. Now, the recommendations in CP110 were then adopted almost unchanged in BS8110, and that's still UK Covenant Code's practice. So we're still, we've not really come an awfully long way. Let's say I got interested in the subject in the early 1980s, and I ended up working out some ideas, and they were published in a paper in the Institution of Civil Engineers, 1986. Now, if we think about how a slender column, you're trying to solve the problem of how does a slender, what's the strength of a slender column? If if you imagine a slender column, you've got in the curvature of the section at mid height. As you increase the curvature of the section, as you bend it, the moment that you develop in the section increases. There's that graph shows some typical relations. So the, the more the more you, you the, the column gets curved at at mid height, the more moment is developed. However, if you look at the buckling of the column, the other side of the coin is that the more it flexes at mid height, the more it deflects, and the more it deflects, the great the greater is the moment in the column. So you've got to balance the moment that develops in the column against the moment resistance of the section and if you find if you find the column can get to a state where the moment resistance at mid height is greater than the corresponding deflect moment times deflect sorry axial load times deflection that's the moment developed at mid height then the column will stand up it is safe if you cannot find a, a, a combination of deflected shape curvature and moment wh <coughs> where the apply the applied moment is less than the moment resistance then the column fails and that's what you're trying to solve now bearing in mind that if you look at the graph on the left from the nature of reinforced concrete you've not got it's not tidy linear behavior you've got the it's non-linear and it varies with the amount of axial load on the section. So the, the, own, the standard approach is to use a computer and do it by trial and error. Basically, you guess a deformed shape for the column, work out the moment resistance that goes with the curvature of the column, work out the deflection, and you keep trial and error with that until you find the combination that just achieves equilibrium. I, when I got to looking at it, I thought, well, is there another way to come at this that's maybe a bit faster and easier? The first thought was, if instead of plotting moment against section curvature, moment resistance against section curvature at the mid height of the column, so at a moment, you could plot load eccentricity. So you could plot load eccentricity against section curvature. Then for the deflection, the buckling deflection of the column, that's quite easy. It's a linear relationship. The more the column gets curved at mid height, the more it deflects. So that's the shape of the buckling deflection line for a given slenderness of column. Then what I did was, do, you, do any of you remember a thing called, stuff called tracing paper? 
used to be very popular. If you put the buckling deflection graph on tracing paper and lay it on top of the load eccentricity graph, hey presto, you can, without any computerized trial and error, you can read the answer straight off. So in the particular case I'm showing there, with no load eccentricity, the load capacity of that column is not 0.7 times its, its crushing capacity. And then you can, it's very easy to allow for load eccentricity. Imagine that line, the straight line, is on a piece of tracing paper. Just slide it up. So if there's a, a, an initial load eccentricity of 0.1 of the section depth, the same section, look, and you can see, you can read off immediately, load capacity has dropped from 0.7 of the crushing capacity to 0.4 with that, with that eccentricity. It's quite a powerful technique, and it, it gets better. What you can do, imagine this magic sheet of tracing paper that has a single line on it. Well, you could put onto it lines corresponding to all the whole range of slendernesses of columns. And you could offset the bottom ends of those lines by an amount to allow for initial imperfections, as in the left-hand graph there. Now, if you imagine that graph is on a piece of tracing paper, and it's overlaid on top of the column load eccentricity curves, you can immediately read off instantly the load capacities of a whole range of column slendernesses. Once you get to that point, it's faster than any computer program. If you, can, you, if you look at it closely, you can see that for a slenderness ratio of 15, in this case, the capacity was 0.72 of the, the squash load. If, if the slenderness ratio is 30, it's 0.3. If the slenderness ratio is 50, it's 0.1. It's a very fast, powerful technique. And it, not only is it fast and powerful to analyze these things, but it allows you to, range, to analyze a very wide range of column slendernesses and load eccentricity very rapidly. So that first paper I wrote was first based on first shot at the subject. And it, we we'll go back to, the, the, those are the, the, the design recommendations of CP114, CP110, and BS8110. And from the accurate analysis I'd done, which the design rules went into an Institute of Structural Engineers publication in 1991, and you can see, just like in steel, it, it's an S-shaped curve, is the correct curve. And the, the straight flat bits, in the BS codes are simply wrong. Following that paper 1986, Leeds University did a lot of research in the 1990s. In particular, there was a, an MSc done by Abibi Dinku, and then a PhD by Nariman Khalil. And when that was all done, I, Nariman Khalil and I wrote a joint paper sum, summarizing what, we'd, what had been worked out which was a more accurate analysis than what I'd done previously, but also it extended it over the whole range of concrete strengths, right up to high strength concrete, high strength concretes, you know, cube strengths of 80 newtons a square millimeter. And as part of her PhD, she also did some load tests, and those, the results of those were published in the Structural Engineer in 2001. Meanwhile, of course, Eurocodes were coming into view. And I realized, what if Eurocode 2 is still going to use the same old method of BS8110 and CP110? It would be an awful shame, seeing it's, the answers are so bad. So I got in touch with relevant people, and they, they put me in touch with the guy who had written the recommendations in Eurocode 2. And he is a Swedish engineer by the name of Bo Westerberg. And it turned out, no, they weren't following the old 
CP110, BS810 rules. He'd done, he'd gone back to first principles, done his own research from hey, back to the basics and worked out, done a lot of research and worked out a hey, rules based on that. I, I compared, we, I was, I got in touch with him and we compared results and it was clear that his analysis and Myra's analysis were both giving almost identical results, which you shouldn't be surprised if you're working from, if you've gone back to first principles and you're working with correct basic theory, you should get the same results. So in principle, the Eurocode 2 design rules are much better than BS810. The only problem is, as I think many of you will know, is they're very complicated. I came back to the subject recently. I was in touch with the concrete people at the concrete centre who are working on revision, new revisions to Eurocode 2. And one of the pressures is on is to try to make Eurocode 2 a bit simpler. And I said, you know, column design is a real problem. I said, well, we've got some ideas we can work with on that. But I went back to it again to see if I could work out really simple design rules. The problem you come to is that, as I've shown you, the graphical analysis is very simple and powerful and accurate for a comprehensive analysis of reinforced concrete columns, but it's not suitable for everyday design. There's a lot of work in working out the moment curvature relationships for the concrete. And because reinforced concrete is such a complicated material, you can't really, it's not possible to render the answers out, the results out to some simple formula. The only way forward really is a, a semi-empirical approach. If you think of it as a method of do, design of count, design calculations for reinforced concrete columns, work out a method, then compare the results from it with the results from the accurate analysis, then adjust the coefficients and so on in your design method. Basically play around with it and try and adjust it to get as good a an agreement as, as is possible to the correct theory. I think that's the only possible approach. So what I looked for was a simple approximate method which would give a reasonable match to the results of an accurate theoretical analysis but would err on the conservative side. The idea being that by being simple and conservative it could easily either be used directly for design or else it could be used for initial scheme design, and then the design could be refined by more exact analysis. The problem in trying to work out a method is the problem of eccentric loads when columns are carrying moments as well as that as they as well as axial loads. This is just telling telling you where the results got written up. They were published in Concrete magazine in May last year, proposals for simplifying your code too. If you go back to steel columns, an eccentric load of the steel column, you'll be familiar with that kind of equation where you've got the axial load in the column divided by its axial capacity plus the moment divided by its moment resistance to be less than one. The general effect of that is that the more moment the column carries, the less the effect of slenderness is because slenderness has less of an effect on the moment resistance calculation. However, in reinforced concrete, that's not what happens. As, the, as you increase the moment in the concrete, this increases the cracking and reduces the stiffness of the column. And it, so moments in reinforced concrete columns actually make buckling effects worse, whereas they make them less in steel columns, they make them worse in reinforced concrete. And if you try to come up with a simple method based on the axial load capacity of the column, you'll find that it's un unsafe for eccentric loads. What I therefore did was, I went to the other end of things, thought, try and work out a simple method that would give reasonable answers for eccentric loads and accept that there would be some conservatism for pure axial loads. And this is how the results came out. First of all, these are the actual method I come up with was a very simple additional moment method. Simply depending on the slenderness of the column, 
you apply an, ex an additional eccentricity to the load, which works out as an additional moment on the column. You design the section for that, and that is that settles the design. Now, for axially loaded columns, these graphs show how it compared. This is for cube strength of 40 newtons a square millimeter. The two graphs are for 0.8% reinforcement or for 4%. If you look at the graphs, the solid line is the prediction of the accurate theoretical analysis. The dotted line is current Eurocode 2 design rules. And the dashed line is the result from my proposed simplified method. And you'll see that for Slendon, this ratio is up to about 10 or 12, which is the vast majority of columns that we build. The proposed method is actually perfectly accurate enough, but it gets quite conservative beyond that. However, notice also that Eurocode 2 is actually unconservative for slender, for, for axially loaded columns in the region with slenderness ratios in the regions of region of 15 or 20. Now we turn to eccentrically loaded columns. And these graphs show for a column with 0.8% reinforcement, comparing again theory, Eurocode 2, and the design proposals. And the graph on the left, the load eccentricity is 0.1 of the section width. And the graph on the right is 0.5. So it's a practical range of load eccentricities. And you can see that the proposed design method, that's the dashed line, is very good, very close agreement with the theoretical analysis. And Eurocode 2 also gives good agreement, but is a, bit, a little bit on the unconservative side. It's for slenderness is the region of 10. Then looking at four, more heavily, that was minimum reinforcement in a column. The column's got 4% steel in it, which is about the effective maximum. Here's how the results come out. And again, the agreement across the whole range of loads ex load eccentricities is very good indeed. It's very close. And again, Eurocode 2 is slight, er, slightly on the unconservative side. Then extended it to very high strength concrete columns. So this is for concrete of a cube strength at 80 newtons a square millimeter. And these are graphs for load eccentricity of 0.1 H, but got very similar results across the whole range of load eccentricities. So again, you can see the, the, the agreement for such a simple method, the agreement is actually remarkably good. So the upshot is, this, this is it is possible to come up with a, a design method that's much simpler than BS8110, almost infinitely simpler than Eurocode 2. It's, it gives very accurate results for eccentric loads, and it's a little a bit on the conservative side for pure column, a slender column supporting a perfectly concentric load. I, I was pleasantly surprised just how good agreement could be got. And I think for a simple design method, it's well worth using. In practical terms, you could use it for all column design. There are situations if you were designing a column that was very slender and had purely axial load, it might be worth trying to refine the design based on an exact analysis. And secondly, if the column was, if you have a column that was carrying main slender column carrying mainly short term loads, it it might be worth going to a more exact analysis because all of these comparisons are based on long-term loads because long-term loads are what columns usually carry. But I would venture to suggest that this design method is, to use the term, good enough for all practical design. It's been put to the, Euro, the British Eurocode delegation and it's being considered. I'm not sure that Brexit has helped the chances of British engineers getting any changes into your codes. But I understand consideration is being given to putting this design method into the national annex for Eurocode 2.
revise your foot when it appears. If you, any of you want to read in more detail about some of the issues that have been raised in the course of this, that's a list of my relevant technical papers, which are all available on our technical papers website. And I would, I would thank the institution, the Structural Engineers and Civil Engineers, Concrete Magazine, and BSI for permission to reproduce extracts from their publications in this talk tonight. I hope you found this useful. Thank you. Right, yeah. Um, so this, uh, this question is from uh, Zegos. And um, they're asking if a, uh, so I'll, I'll probably just read it out verbatim rather than try to summarize it just in case, actually. Um, say we have a concrete column supporting a three story structure, and then above that, um, there is a column which is extended 12 meters up to support a steel roof. Um, in this case, a, say a, a compression ring of stadium stadium roof. Um, should this column have a buckling length for a cantilever, so two times the effective length, or should it have more than that? And how would you approach this via a, a sort of rule of thumb? So you've got a three uh, three meter column followed by uh, followed by another length of column above the floor plate that goes up 12 meters supporting supporting another load. Uh, is a buckling length for the cantilever of two times the effective length if, uh, uh, adequate? The answer is probably no. If you go back to, I'm just trying to flick back quickly to the table from the steel code. It's okay it's for a steel code, but the same principles apply. Two, the effective length factor of two is the theoretical effective length factor for a cantilever with fixed base. Now, if you've got a column that's actually going down to Story, lower stories of the building, then unless the incoming beams at the at the base of it are very stiff, then there's going to be a bit of flexibility there. Uh, I was just looking to see what was said. Now the, the the steel code doesn't really address it, but it's this kind of situation where, especially when you're talking something very slender, you're know, twelve meters twelve meters high. I think you have to think quite carefully about it. I can't give you a number because I would, I would say I would absolutely want to look very carefully at the structure. How stiff are the incoming beams at the base of the column? How stiff is the column itself? Is there any moment resistance at the head of the column? Is there any bracing in the structure? Yeah, that's a classic one where you don't just pull, pluck a number out there and say, right, and design, you know, press the buttons on the computer. You've got to you have to think. You have to think about it from first principles, and maybe carry out a bit of analysis too. You might find that those charts, although I was saying for general purposes, they're they're no use. Those charts in BS fifty nine fifty would be worth looking at just as a piece of basic information to feed in, because you could at least see where you were starting from before you allow for connection flexibility. But I would think, in a, it, coming back to your question, that you're probably going to be in the effective length factor in the region of three or more, depending on the exact stiffnesses of everything involved. So essentially it's it's the it's taking into account the stiffnesses of the wider uh, the wider system to which that column is attached that will that will govern the effective length. Because of how well those uh, yes, it's how, yeah, it, it's how well it's restrained against rotation at its base, how well it's restrained against rotation and it's at its head, and is there any restraint against lateral movement or not? Oh. But with with that sort of legs, twelve meters high, you want to be very careful. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, another one. It's, uh, also quite uh, specific, I believe many engineers are uh, asking questions about <laughs> about projects they may have worked on in the past or are currently, currently looking at working on. So um, we have here uh, a question from Karina. Um, a multi-story building um, 
uh, a single frame with uh, no bracing and all the beams pinned, pinned excuse me, uh, with the columns fixed at the base. What would you consider to be used uh, for the buckling length of these columns? Multi-story, well, <laughs> if you excuse me coming back, a, we're going to come back at this. If you really have a multi-story building and all the beam and it's unbraced and all the beams are pinned to the columns and the, beam, the columns are only fixed at their bases, I think you've got a very bad design. It's going to sway like fury. You've really got to develop some moment at the floor levels in the beams. If you've liter if you had literally pinned connections with no stiffness at all the floor heights, then the columns it would be quite easy to work out their effective length. They would, they would, the full height of the column, that's three stories high, times two. And the, it would be t twice the total height of the building. And that's a totally uneconomic so thing to design. Sorry, uh, you wouldn't consider the, uh, the floor plates or the beams incoming, even though they're pinned, to be restraining those columns. Well, I suppose there wouldn't be rotation. Well, I'm, either, saying, I'm, but, um, I'm turning it around. I'm saying, I'm, I'm turning around the, the question. I'm saying, if they really are pinned, then I would say your designs, you've got a bad design. It's not going to work. It's, it's really, you've got to either brace it or you've got to allow moment to be developed where the beams frame into the columns. The minute you can develop a bit of, a bit, it doesn't need to be a large amount of moment in, in the beam column connections, then the whole thing becomes quite easy to make it work. Um, you do, it, they don't need to be massively reinforced. If, it's, if, the, if the connections are enough to resist wooden moments, then you are going to deserve, d develop moments at the floor levels. And in that situation, I would be my I would be saying um, because that is a call, that's a very common one. We call wind moment design. Again, you've got to look at it and think about it. Which way round are the columns? If they're, they're eye section columns, if in the direction, in the strong direction of the columns, you've probably got even with moment you've got there, you've still got quite a long effective length but you've got a good radius of gyration. However, in the other direction, it also depends on how many columns you've got in direction too. But in the other direction, the, sle the, the minor axis of the columns, the beams are, the incoming beams in a well-designed structure are probably quite a lot stiffer than the minor axis of the columns. And so in fact, you're develop it's quite easy to develop a useful moment at the floor level. And the effective length factor I would be going for in the strong direction of the columns might well be one and a half, but in the minor axis direction, you might well get it down to one or thereabouts. Again, it depends on the proportions of the members. If you've got quite deep beams coming in on the minor axis of the columns, then your effective length comes down. But if they're only tie beams, it goes up. So, but I, I think coming back to the beginning, to come up with a satisfactory design that's not going to deflect all over the place and collapse, you have, if it's an unbraced structure, you have got, you, you have to try to develop moment at each lower level to get the effect of length down. You've got to engineer it so that you are developing some moment. I think, that's, uh, I think that's sound advice, actually. <laughs> right, uh, thank you very much. I've got a couple more here. I'm just um, trying to uh, collapse some of these into these are very similar sort of questions. Um, so uh, there are a couple of questions um, from um, some of the delegates about, uh, number one, um, composites uh, filled tube columns and uh, the use of uh, aluminium or ductile steel in column design. Like, what do you think of the? Uh, are there any sort of view, particular views or, or, or literature that you could recommend um, for ductile aluminium columns or, or, or composite filled tube columns, basically? I'm not an expert on those. I, I can't point you to lots of detailed information on that. The theory 
the actual theory that applies is very much the same. You can analyze you can analyze them with the same theory, but a exact de exact detail I can't really help you with. They're the relevant. I would the starting point is always go to the relevant codes of practice and see what they say, and try and make sense of what they say and work from there. But a, 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 a steel tube column filled with concrete is mostly a steel tube with a little bit of help from some concrete. Most of the stiffness is provided by the steel. And so I would expect that would behave, dominate its, a, its bits buckling behavior. Aluminium, it's just another metal. It's got different, it's got a different Young's modulus, different stresses, but the theories that apply are exactly the same as the steel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think that answers most of the uh, most of the questions about sort of more general materials. Um, there's one about timber, which I think that answers as well. Um, here's a here's an interesting one. Um, what um, aside from aside from the for example the steel uh, thermal um, the differential cooling effect in the st in steel sections. How does um, in in very long columns? How does a uh, how does a raking column or a, a section of uh, of, of a different? Um, oh, sorry. Apologies. Merging two questions which uh, shouldn't be merged. Okay, right. Let's start with the first one. Um, right. Uh, raking columns or incline columns. How do you cater for the for the buckling effects on on columns which aren't vertical? You've got to analyze the loads. What you if you think about it, a, a raking column in is is a straight. It's assuming it's straight. It's got an axial load in it. It may have moments applied at the ends at its ends, and in addition, its self weight is generating. A moment transversely to the column, and provided you put all of those correctly into your calculations, there's no reason why normal calculation can't apply. It's only if you forget to allow for the, the transverse bending caused by the weight of the column, things like that. The other thing, of course, is it depends on your bracing arrangements. A, if it's an unbraced structure, you've got to be quite careful with an inclined column because things can start to move around a lot under load. But if it's a braced structure, there's really nothing. You've just got to remember to allow for the for all the loads. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's so the the methods still apply. You just have to be a little bit more yes. careful about where yeah. and how you apply. See, an un, an unbraced structure with with inclined columns. You want to think a little bit more carefully there. You've got to think about your secondary deflections. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, so uh, we've got a question here from Johannes. Um, it's quite a long question. I'll try and summarize as best as I can. Um, moment resisting frame, moment resisting frame. Um, with regard, I think this is concrete, yeah. So a concrete moment resisting frame. Um, the traditional method is a sort of subframe analysis, I think, where um, you take a column, um, you take a, a sort of a, a, a sort of stack of columns and you uh, apply um, sort of a moment distribution sort of system to it where you end up um, having a fully fixed set of beams come into it. I mean, is that an appropriate method to use still? Or is is this is this sort of antiquated and, 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 and superseded by something else? It, it's old, but it's not wrong. <laughs> it, it's a perfectly good <laughs> method to do. Um, this is one of the things I wanted to give as a message to engineers. We Because we can do because we've got fancy computer programs that can do all kinds of fancy calculations, it's easy to forget how the the basics that really matter are not complicated and not fancy. 
And if if you've got to roughly the right answer, and then you think carefully about beyond that, then you're going to be all right. Now, taking the specific example of a multi-story sway frame, a, if you've done that simple analysis, you've got something like the correct forces and moments. The thing that you do need to be caref a bit careful about in a sway frame is the effective length factors. And it's worth thinking about them floor by floor. See where I'm going with this. At, in theory, if a column is perfectly fixed top and bottom in a sway frame, then its effective length factor is 2 times not 0.5, which is 1. However, if there's any flexibility at either end, it's more than 1. Now, I would say that in a sway frame like we're talking about there, if you go to the ground floor, the bases, the bases of, the, of the bottom columns probably are pretty well fixed by the foundations. But there's a bit of flexibility at the heads of, the, of those columns. So you've got an effective length factor that's a bit over one, but not enormously. And then when you go up to the higher parts of the building, there's a bit of flexibility at the top and the bottom of each column. Now, how much that comes to depends on the, how, the, the ratio of the stiffness of the beams to the stiffness of the columns. And if your beams are stiffer than your columns, you're probably looking at an effective length factor of the region of one and a half or so. But it does depend. If, if in a well-designed stru structure, you you arrange the, be the the stiffest beams. If you've got the stiff beams coming in on the, the slender direction of the columns, then that's going to keep the effective length factors down. But if you have a if you do it the other way around, it doesn't doesn't work so well. So the point to watch is that you can have effective length factors of more than one. That's the key thing I wanted to bring out in that one. Look at it and think about it carefully. But provided you you think about it carefully, those simple methods are fine, and you're probably a lot nearer the right answer than the person who is just pushing buttons on a computer and picking numbers out of drop-down boxes without any thought. <laughs> I am the computational design engineer at the, uh, at the institution, so I, I, but I won't take that as a personal slight. Um, <laughs> um, that I think I think I think that more or less answers the question. Um, don't, uh, so you think it's um, it, it's it's important. It's still to, a valid method, the subframe analysis. Yeah, it's good enough. It's subframe still valid and it's important to consider the actual construction of the building when it comes to fixity at the end. So is it still reasonable to consider those beams that are incoming to those columns as fully fixed at the opposite ends away from the columns? Yeah. The, the other thing I would say, by the way, is for people who say, oh, well, but we can do more accurate analysis than that, bear in mind that how a reinforced concrete structure is actually built. Where there'll be a bay of the, there'll be there are day joints. The sh the shuttering the the formwork is struck at different times, different areas. If you actually measure the mom the moments in the structure, they you'd be I think you would get a fright just how different they were from what the lovely theoretical calculations you've done. This is providing the contract. The reason. There's all sorts of things can go on. Um, so provided you've got the thing well proportioned and you've catered for the total loads that have to be carried, then reinforced concrete or steel are, are ductile. And if there is a local overstress, then that can be, the loads can redistribute. As long as the structure is strong enough, it'll work. So we don't need to be too precious about exact calculations to four significant figures of the the moment at every point and everything i think that answers uh, fairly well um a, a similar question we had from olivia actually um who was asking about the inherent sort of non-linear uh phenomena associated with um with sort of p delta effects and, and the like and whether um 
numerical models are more accurate or not. And I think you've, you've answered that already with that um, question, I think. So, yeah, thank you. We call them buckling in um, the LT effect. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, uh, the point there is you either analyze a perfect structure and then put in allowance for PDLT effects, or else you analyze it and use the standard allowable the standard rules for column design, which already allow for the PDLT effects. The mistake is, unless you've got quite a, an, a wacky structure, you don't usually have to allow for PDLT effects twice. And with that, you've answered another uh, one of our questions from uh, from from Niall, I believe, about applying building imperfection to a global model um, to leave aside the buckling lengths uh, initially, and then then apply apply them in the design phase. So that's uh, that's good as well. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, right. Here's a here's an interesting one from uh, from Ahmed. Um, I believe EC2 already gives you the option of using one of two methods for design. Isn't your um, isn't your um, uh, latest method very similar to the method based on nominal curvature in EC2? Superficially, yes. In pra in in reality, no, not at all. The the current EC2 methods, I think, they're known as the very complete method and the extremely complicated method um, but a the the nominal curvature me method EC2 looks looks the same as what I'm proposing in other words there are additional moments however the the actual figures that are that are fed into it have come from a completely different place the U the year code 2 method as well, work them out one way. I've explained how I've worked them out. The the figures that I've, I'm proposing are, don't come from a theoretical analysis. They've basically been a semi-empirical curve fitting. Basically, I've worked out the figures need to be to give results that match very closely to an accurate theoretical analysis. It's a semi-empirical method. It's a back calculation. Now. The other thing is that the EC2 method, once you get into it, there's layer upon layer upon layer of complexity. You start with something fairly simple, but then you've got to put in a factor for this, a factor for that, an adjustment factor for this and so on. It's, it really is hard work. And that was the reason why I did the work for this, for this proposal. Those figures, that table, that I put up on the screen of additional moments. That's all you need. That is all there is to the calculation. All the other layers of factors in your code to don't apply. You simply apply that additional moment of proposing, and that that's sufficient to allow for your buckling effects. You don't need to do anything else. So it's mu it looks similar in the face of it. In reality, it's vastly simpler. Uh, one from John. Um, Alistair, do you have anything to say about the plastic design of steelwork and the buckling of columns? Ha, ah, that's a good one. <laughs> Stop and think for a minute. Plastic design of steelwork is is basically app is applied in portal. The prim primary place is portal frame. And in portal frames, axial loads are generally extremely small. It's the moment capacity of the column and the rafter that are, that are critical. And so you can apply plastic design without much worry about buckling effects. <coughs> Provide, if you think more about it, the main forces in a portal frame are in the plane of the frame, but the columns at the side of the building, their buckling capacity is transversely to that. And firstly, that's more or less independent of the plastic bending. But secondly, you've got to deal with that by bracing the columns at right angles to the columns. Um, that's portal frames. If you say plastic design in general, it depends what
you're doing with it. Plastic design is, plastic analysis is just a way of working out the moments in a frame. And a, as long as the moments that are calculated don't deviate too wildly from what the elastic moments would be, then I don't think, then there isn't a problem. But if you came up with a structure where you were assuming plastic, you know, plastic behavior and the plastic hinges and the columns and beams and they might really happen in service, then you'd have to be careful because buckling is a stiffness issue. But um, it's hard to answer the question as a sort of an all encompassing answer because plastic design is, at least to the best of my knowledge, is 99% of plastic design in this country is, is done in one very specific class of structures. And it's a class of structures where buckling in the plane of the total frames is just, is a very small problem. The, the, it's buckling out in the right angles to them and normal rules are applied for that. I don't know whether this has any Does that answer your question? Pardon? Sorry. Um, I don't know whether this has um, implications for earthquake design at all, because of course our, our audience today is actually very, very much international. So um, um, I don't know whether you have a comment on earthquake design in that situation. Earthquakes, earthquake design is, is an old thing in its own right to think about. I don't have lots of experience of it, but it's first thing to be said. You, that you can have stand, standard rules for standard situations and then if you've got something like earthquakes to consider you've got to think about them individually. The interesting thing in earthquakes is say for reinforced concrete for example is that the stresses in earthquake are, short, are all short term loads whereas for buckling in concrete columns it's long term loads that call, with where creep reduces the stiffness. A, so your buckling effects don't necessarily go up in an earthquake, but you have a whole set of different issues to think about in earthquake design, haven't you? It's about ductility of the stru ductile structures rather than brittle structures. A lot to do with the detailing of steel connections or, con or reinforced concrete connections. Right, okay. Um, and the last question, I'm sorry to those of you who have uh, asked other questions. Um, unfortunately, we can't, we can't keep going forever. Um, um, Non-prismatic sections. Um, what's your, uh, what's your, uh, in your experience, is that, is that been a, uh, has that been a, uh, a contentious topic at all? Because of course, now that we're seeing a lot of uh, trees, various sort of stadia and design them um, you're seeing a lot of uh, castings which are not prismatic in, in nature um, so I don't know whether this is a this is a problem with the current era code or design methodologies well you're talking about concrete ones or steel ones the first thing to be said. well are we talking fact, about concrete fact, steel is obviously the difference um, in case of steel well in in cases in the case of steel it's the same theory that applies. You've just got to work it out for the exact shapes and forms of the members you're dealing with. Um, it, there's, the physics doesn't change. Reinforced concrete, I could say, I could flip it and say that, but if you're designing a, a, a slender, non-prismatic, reinforced concrete column, you've got a complicated problem. My inclination in that sort of situation would be to use simple design rules like the ones I'm proposing to get the design into the right ballpark, to get this, the initial sizing of the thing roughly right. And then if it's, if it's a pretty fancy shape and or quite a bit of complexity, there's nothing for it. You've got to crank up your computer and do quite a bit of analysis. But I still think that I'm, I, I am one for, I'm never gonna give up on simple design methods, the value of them, because even when the problem's complex, they have the merit that one is they help you 
to find the right place to start in size and shape of your structure. And secondly, you can use them as a sanity check on the answers you get out of your fancy computer analysis, even if they can't deal with all the fiddly complexities of the thing. They can still tell you if you're in the right ballpark, as the saying goes. In a sense, it's a, it's a, it's a case of building the intuition prior to throwing it into the computer model so that you can understand how the things yeah. work and how they're distributed in the structure. Yeah. And just going back to the, very, the, the bit I put at the very beginning of the talk, those four basic equations, it was a principle I learned right back in my early days at Freeman Fox and Partners. We're designing huge cable stay bridges and things. Um, it what impressed me when I, my boss Mike Parsons, who was he did the design calculations for Fourth Bridge, Severn Bridge, and his major contributor on Bosphorus Bridge as well. He he's, he's one of the big engineers of the time. Very nice man, a very sensible engineer. And what impressed me about him was if you asked him a tricky problem, he would say, well, let's go back to first principles. He wasn't afraid to go back to a very simple basic calculation that would establish the basics of what you were dealing with, get a hold of the magnitudes of forces and the, 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 the behavior that was going on. It wouldn't give you the last word on every stress or, or anything of it, but it, it was always keen on getting a hold of the very, very simple basics of the situation, making sure you got them right before we went on to the other stuff. And I, I think that's a golden principle. The more complicated the structure, actually, the more important it is to keep sight of the simple basics that underlie it because it's the same laws of gravity that pull everything down.